Good afternoon. This is Joy Hoffmeister, State Superintendent, and I want to welcome those of you joining us on the call. We're so pleased you're with us. I know it's been quite a day uh, with a number of you following the board meeting and uh, various questions afterwards with the media. And now we are on this call today, and I just uh, know that there are still a number of questions and there will continue to be. Uh, please know that we're eager to uh, assist in answering those questions. There will be guidance that will come in, uh, in you know, various days um, all along this process. But uh, I'm going to start with a few updates. Some of you may not have been able to hear some of the things that we discussed. So I'm going to just touch on a couple of things and then we will open it up for Q&A. Uh, here in the State Department of Education seated a, a minimum of six feet apart is uh, Brad Clark, General Counsel, um, as well as uh, Phil Bacharach, Chief of Staff. Uh, we've also got Jeremy Irons and um, Gary, who are just making this all happen with all the tech uh, that is, we're grateful for. So thank you guys. We have Carolyn on the line as well, and she will be reading through and answering your questions. So I'm going to just get started with this status update on the virus. Uh, currently, we have 164 positive cases as of today, five deaths in the state, and 59 hospitalized. Governor Snit, uh, excuse me, Governor Stitt announced yesterday that he is enforcing a safer at home order statewide, directing Oklahomans who are particularly vulnerable to the virus to shelter at their homes until April 30th, restricting their movements only to trips for essentials like groceries and medicine. Vulnerable, vulnerable populations are the elderly and those immunocompromised or with pre-existing health conditions. The governor also closed all non-essential business in the um, counties with the confirmed COVID-19 cases. This includes gyms, salons, theaters, and museums. And also we are still under the CDC guidelines prohibiting groups greater than 10 from gathering. Uh, last week, I did not mention this, and I, I wanted to mention what we put out in a press release about the donation request to hospitals and nursing homes. So Friday, we sent out the letter to school leaders asking for your help with desperate shortage of medical supplies. We asked them to be donated uh, for with any unused masks, eye protection, gloves, disinfectant. Um, wipes, hand sanitizers, and take those two directly to the <coughs> local nursing home or hospital as there is desperate need and they have been alerted that schools will be dropping these by and coordinating that drop off. And then as I alluded to earlier, we had a State Board of Education meeting, the first ever to be held virtually. Um, we had some 50,000 who watched that, which is incredible, and I think we've had um, probably not ever had that much engagement around a state board meeting before, uh, but it was because of what was considered today, and we know that it impacts hundreds of thousands of students and families. So to recap today's meeting, this morning the board issued an amendment to its prior order for school closure. The amendment suspends in-person instruction and extracurricular activities for the remainder of the school year. Districts must comply with the CDC guidelines and apply a health and safety policy that ensures students, staff, and families are not exposed to pathogens that could lead to illness. School buildings will remain closed for the remainder of the year for general student and personnel attendance with the following exceptions. Providing nutrition services, essential core services, and staff for purpose of facilitating or supporting the required delivery of distance learning. Essential serv core services include governance, HR, billing, 
maintenance, and continuity of building functions, staff to maintain building access control and security measures, and student enrollment. The board's order also directs districts to begin now from, a, uh, from now through April 6th to provide OSCE with an expedited waiver request instead of assurance and this is going to be very simple, um, very similar to our federal waiver for assessment and accountability, where it was a template. So please, please don't be overly concerned about the length of time this would, would uh, take. And part two, the board directs districts now through April 6th to prepare for and begin distance learning. Preparations may include immediately convening staff development virtually, <clears throat> consistent with the internet with the intent and purposes of this order. Um, we know that there will be um, some need for those core individuals, and when I threw in the word virtually, I am thinking about how we communicate with teachers and our, our um, staff. Every effort should be made to do that in a way that is not in person. To be clear, this action by the board allows for staff development and other meetings to begin to occur immediately to, prior, uh, to prepare for in, uh, the instructional services to resume. However, I want to emphasize that this must be done virtually whenever possible, as I just mentioned, and with the utmost, communicate, uh, utmost caution for the safety of all involved. The waiver includes school calendar requirements, length of instructional day, flexibility on the use of textbook funds, the audit acknowledgement form required, and accreditation deficiencies and penalties. In exchange for this waiver, schools assure that they will develop and implement a continuous learning plan for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year, which ends on or after May 8, 2020. In the, board, in the board meeting, we gave a range of May 8 through May 15. If a district selects that and choose us to go longer that they certainly may do. But we believe it is best to have a narrow window and range for an end date for instruction. The assurances also include compliance with the CDC guidelines and required health and safety policies that limit the opportunity for staff, students, and families to be exposed to the, to the virus. It also requires that schools assure they are in compliance with IDEA, FERPA, and the governor's executive orders. Additionally, the board adopted two emergency rules in response to the pandemic. First, it adopted a rule to allow for a third year extension of emergency certified teachers. The district must make this recommendation and agree to hire that teacher next year. The teacher must also have received an effective rating or higher on their most recent TLE evaluation and submit a portfolio of work, which includes evidence of progress toward a standard teaching certificate. The second emergency rule allows for the department to grant an emergency medical exemption for a group of students. The department will grant this exemption to eighth grade students who need the scores of the English language arts test to apply for a driver's permit or license. The department will also grant this exemption to all 11th grade students needing to take the US history test for graduation. Okay, on the topic of the survey that we we are discussing related to IT and distance learning. Last night, superintendents should have received an email asking you to assess your district's techno technological capability 
or capacity for online distance learning. There are many emerging opportunities for us to partner with other agencies and communications companies to provide additional internet connectivity, either through the use of mobile hotspots, expansion of broadband, or free internet in low-income homes. Additionally, a new federal stimulus package is moving through Congress that has specific funding for K-12 schools. This survey will help us to broadly assess where our needs are across the state. As of noon today, we had around 330 responses. We only need one response per district. So you're doing great with getting these back to us, and we have um, a, a good 200 more to go, in or 211 more to go in order to reach our 541 districts. So I want to thank you for that overwhelming response and how swiftly you are replying. If you have not completed the survey, please do so quickly. Um, only one response again per district. And the due date is Friday at 9 a.m. We will be turning that information over on Friday to state cabinet secretaries who are working to develop a proposal um, in some of the areas that I just described. All right, let's talk about distance learning. Erin Estolt, OSDE's Executive Director of School Design and Innovation, and a host of tireless and dedicated members of OSDE staff have been working hard to develop a distance learning framework and resources that we anticipate will be on the agency's website by the end of the week. It, and let me tell you, it's very robust, and um, I think it'll be very helpful. It will include a lot of material, but we believe these resources and guidance will be of real value for schools navigating through this period. To that end, we've had many questions about whether or not the virus can survive on paper in reference to teachers delivering packets or lessons to students. The information, the best information we have available to us from the World Health Organization, they have an FAQ that reads as follows. Quote, it is safe to receive a package from any area where COVID-19 has been, here's the question, is it safe to receive a package from anywhere COVID-19 has been reported? And the answer is yes. The likelihood of an infected person contaminating commercial goods is low and the risk of catching the virus that causes COVID-19 from a package that has been moved, traveled, and exposed to different conditions and temperature is also low. We are hoping to have a more precise recommendation for you in the coming days as we have sought guidance from our state epidemiologist. But we wanted you to have what information is available right now. Also, a support staff update. Please know we are still working on a solution to allow the support staff that are either prohibited from working due to the governor's executive order or who are unable to work during this time to be paid. I know this has taken longer than most of us would have liked, but I want you to know that we are diligently working on a solution. And then I will uh, wrap up these comments and then we'll move to questions by making an announcement about our Friday meeting. And that is that U.S. Senator James Langford will join our call on Friday at 1 p.m. to discuss the federal response. And we're delighted of his interest and we appreciate him taking the time to do that with all of you. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and start taking some questions and hear from uh, those of you who are on this webinar on call. Hello, Superintendent. Can you hear me? This is Carolyn. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, we have several questions um, regarding our recommendations on allowing uh, students and or teachers to come back into the school to get personal items that they might have left there uh, prior to spring break. Would you have any um, suggestions for the group on that? All right, this is a very, um, I think, common question and you're going to receive more of these. 
um, the my request would be not to hold an open window of time where we would have a lot of people coming at the same time. Uh, what would be preferable, however, it may not be very practical, but it would be preferable, and I hope that you will seek to do this. And that is to uh, ask uh, to to fulfill these requests more by appointment. And as you receive the request, um, ask them to email that. Um, and then we could coordinate a time, for instance, for medicine to be picked up. Um, that anything we can do that could allow for a swift handoff, uh, even curbside like the meals, would be ideal. Um, but we would ask you to please use your best judgment in complying with the CDC guidelines and remember that everyone who walks in the building leaves a trace of a potential contamination that the next person to use that doorknob or push open um, that button or door or um, count, touch the countertop is at risk for taking that uh, home uh, or, or, or leaving contagion. So we want to minimize in fact, I will tell you here at the agency, all our doors are standing open so that no one has to open using doorknobs and handles. Um, that would be preferable if, if someone is going to be coming in. Okay. And by, the um, way, by, by, by the way, by making it more on a appointment basis, uh, you can control who's coming in and out. You can also, um, avoid an all call where I'm sure every, every single person has something they'd like to get back right now. But it is going to become necessary, just like any closure of school at the end of the school year for students and staff to get back in the building. So we know this is something that's going to occur. We would just like to think about how that could be staggered and uh, carefully sanitized in that process. Hey, um, Superintendent, this is really along those same lines, but there's been some questions about whether or not it would be advisable for a teacher to actually teach from their room um, with no kids where um, the teacher might be able to use the tools that they have in their room and um, do so broadcast some sort of virtual instruction out to out to kids. Do you have any recommendations about that? Well, it worries me to think about um, 15 to 20 teachers all up in their rooms doing this at the same time. And I think this is, again, one of those decisions that um, a local school is going to need to make. But uh, let's, let's be very careful not to make new centers of transmission. And that can happen extremely easily, and we want to keep our teachers safe and not spreading it among one another or going home and giving that to their family, some of which are in health care. And uh, I would just say, I know this is inconvenient, but it would be so much more preferable to allow for teachers to have that technology at home so that, that we don't have a regular standard operating procedure of, of teachers somehow doing distance learning uh, all together in their rooms with no kids. Okay, and um, we have some questions about school calendars um, and a, a couple here. Uh, so if the school district um, started um, in early August and was scheduled to go um, until May 1st, uh, do they still need to go at least until May 8th? And then similarly to that, um, does a district follow their previously scheduled calendar? So if they were off scheduled to be off Good Friday, can they still do that? Do they have to go Monday through Friday um, until May 8th to 15th? Could you speak to some of those things? Yeah, Carolyn, this is Brad. I'm, I'm happy to jump in and take that one. Um, at the, the board meeting this morning, the state board granted a uniform and very wide waiver to all schools in the state, um, granting flexibility from the 180 days, 1,080 hour requirement for the school calendar. Um, 
So schools have a great deal of flexibility. With that said, um, the board emphasized um, the May 8th as the on or after for the end of the school year. Um, so I think the recommendation and the intent of the board was uh, May 8th at the earliest, um, but at the same time I do recognize um, with the waivers that were granted uh, flexibilities that may exist from there. But there's no need to um, submit a change in school calendars to the State Department of Education. And we really want to underscore that, you know, we have a, a lot of kids that this disruption after spring break and the two weeks following is um, something that we want to recover, that lost learning time. So I would hope that no one is thinking of truncating the year somehow uh, by by not giving every every opportunity uh, for for these kids to make the most of the remaining uh, six five six weeks or so. And just one follow-on point to that: the assurances document, which again will be short, uh, not complex in any way, uh, will address the assurance that the districts will develop and implement a full continuous learning plan, um, as well as ensuring that the uh, student needs are, are met as appropriate. I, I want to make sure that I go back on um, something and clarify about teachers in the building. We do not want a, the, the schools are closed for instruction, okay? I just want to make that clear. The idea was not to have teachers up in classrooms teaching without kids. That's, that, is, that is still not helping with the whole point of having our, our teachers at home. So I don't mean to have somehow inserted confusion in this, but our schools are closed except for what we just have in the, exec, in the um, amended order today. And if there is a need to have some kind of borrowing of equipment, for the teacher, that is preferable. Okay, Superintendent, um, next question. Uh, could you uh, describe or explain whether or not um, activities and events are included in the closure and for how long? Um, there was question about OSSAA um, perhaps um, taking consideration of this um, in an upcoming meeting. So what is the timeline on the um, prohibition around activities and events? Uh, Carolyn, this is Brad one, once again. Uh, the board's order does uh, specifically say it applies to in-person instruction and in-person extracurricular activities. Um, that would be through the, again, May 8th through the 15th, um, narrow window. Um, with respect to OSSAA and the scheduling of state tournaments, um, I do not believe that uh, the State Department or the State Board have jurisdiction over the scheduling of those events. However, um, it, it's also my understanding that um, they're adhering to the CDC guidelines. And so the example I gave this morning on extracurricular activities was it seems like it would be very difficult to have a basketball game uh, during this time. If you consider five players on each team and a referee, um, you're automatically in violation of those CDC guidelines. So um, if that example is helpful, um, great. Uh, there may be ways to do virtual uh, extracurricular activities. Um, so those, those may be some of the flexibilities that, that exist, but those examples came to mind. Brad um, or Superintendent, could you um, just describe um, the concept behind the waiver request and the assurances and what does that look like and, and when will districts be able to have access to those? Yeah, um, received and, and still seeing some questions about that, so I'm, I'm glad uh, you're bringing this up right now. The, the waivers that were granted were quite broad. Um, across the board, speaking of the instructional day, 
of six hours, there's no longer a requirement that each instructional day be a minimum of six hours. So that, that's just one example. Um, the school hours uh, per, per annual uh, requirement, those were waived as well. Um, we've given additional flexibilities around RSA and the use of funding uh, with RSA, textbook funding, the board um, granted an author authorization this morning to expand on those. Um, the whole list, I won't go through all of the waivers. Um, that, was, that was kind of part one. Part two is uh, the assurance documents. In exchange for the waivers that were granted or authorized, the board said that we want a set of assurances that um, I think there are seven or eight at this time. One is that the district will implement the continuous learning plan. Uh, another piece is that the district has read and, and understands, agrees to comply with requirements of IDEA. I understand that those are already done um, every year, uh, but there has been a lot of new guidance that has come out in the, the extraordinary times that we're in. And so we wanted the assurance to be um, around that, that new guidance, even though um, we know that the assurance is already provided covering IDEA. So once those are are uh, submitted and approved, which it will be a, an expedited review and turnaround, um, the distance learning plan can be implemented. Okay, let's um, move on to some questions around the distance learning and what all is required for that. I'm um, getting a couple of questions about um, uh, maybe seniors that already have enough credits to graduate, do they need to continue with distance learning? Is distance learning required to be provided to all students? So if, I'll take maybe a part of that and is Aaron on, on the call? Well, we'll find out. Um, the first part of that was about the uh, awarding of credits. I think um, as we said this morning, that's Primarily, primarily a local district function uh, with how to award credits, whether that's pass fail or a grade assignment and a determination of when a student uh, meets the, uh, the competencies that are required to earn a credit. So um, the board stressed that point and also um, emphasized a point that um, to the extent possible, um, encourage not negatively impacting students who uh, are graduating the class of 20 or who were on track as, as of, let's say, March 12th, uh, don't negatively impact those students as a result of the times that we're now in. Okay, and I believe Aaron is on um, the call now, Brad, if you wanted to throw a question to him. Yeah, I think the other part of the question surrounded the distance learning, uh, the framework, and, and maybe some time requirements associated with that uh, for credits. But it... Yeah, Brad, I'm on the call now. Uh, this is Aaron Espolt, and again, um, we are putting out the guidance to all the school districts that you should have, hopefully by the end of the week. I understand the urgency on getting some of that guidance and I understand the plans that need to be made with that. And so within that guidance, you'll see that there's recommended times as far as, um, you know, working throughout the day as well as for the rest of the school year. Of course, as you um, get closer to the end of the school year, your credits will be, you know, locally determined, your grading is locally determined how it always has been. So you'll be having, you'll be able to have the freedom to be able to, um, to be able to really kind of find what works best for you. And, and again, the guidance is for the local districts to make their own plans. And um, Aaron or Brad to that end, are there any mandatory requirements for, for the distance learning uh, piece? No, uh, not, not in my mind. Um, I think Aaron just indicated that actually. Um, for, for seniors, of, of course, there are still the graduation requirements uh, that we're looking at. So again, the board emphasized the point this morning, um, it's a local function and we would encourage you um, to not negatively impact students who 
are either on track now or on track towards graduation. So um, that's as best as I can answer that, I think. Okay, along those same lines, are districts expected um, to cover um, all classes, core classes, what subjects? Is there any expectation for what subjects need to be covered at what grade levels? <coughs> Karen, uh, is that addressed at all in the guidance I'm, I'm trying to remember? No, Superintendent, it's not. Um, okay. So that'll that'll be determined locally. Is that right? Uh, the answer is yes. It's a local determination. Sorry. Okay, Brad, could you repeat one more time where districts can find the assurances? Will that be a form that they fill out and where can they get that or when will that be available? Yep, uh, excellent question. It is um, in the process of being completed right now. Uh, I would anticipate that being out either end of day today or tomorrow. Um, as soon as it goes out, I would anticipate similar to what, what Superintendent Hoffmeister mentioned about the federal review process, uh, they will be expedited and turned around very quickly. Okay, and then one last question on this topic, and then maybe we can get, make sure Todd Lofton is on the phone. Um, oh, I see that he is, and then we'll pitch um, a couple of questions to Todd. Um, how will truancy and attendance be treated um, from this point forward? While we'll have the assurance document um, out or and the that was referred to, it will uh, have a question about if you are going to be using the tools from the distance learning framework or not, and that you won't be able to answer until that is out. So I just want to um, help those on the line to appreciate there is a sequence to this. Some of it you'll be able to already answer but it's going to be as brief a process as possible. And then the question, Carol, Carolyn, would you restate that? It had to do with truancy? Uh, yeah, truancy and attendance. Are there any, um, how are schools to treat that during this time? How are they to determine if a student is truant? I don't, I don't think that, that that's changed as um, as it was before, to be honest with you. Um, the only change that, that I can think of uh, surrounds a board vote this morning on two separate items. One is the calculation um, or the time period that's covered for average daily attendance and average daily membership. Um, both of those dates were uh, shortened, so the time frame to, to calculate both of those is now looking at beginning of school year through March 12th, both on ADA average daily attendance and ADM average daily membership. Okay, let's go to some um, questions about um, students with disabilities and IEPs. Um, Todd, could you speak to um, the expectation for how initial evaluations would be completed during this time? Yeah, so we're going to come out with some guidance on Friday. So once we do that, it will be easier to answer some questions. Initial evaluation, nothing in the IDA changes. So there will be, there are exceptional circumstances and also special education programs has also already spoken to this. If an evaluation needs to be done in person, then it would need to essentially wait. Um, during this two-week closure period, most districts have changed their uh, calendar in ed plan. I'm not saying they're changing their school calendar. I'm saying within ed plan to know that those aren't school days. So, and we do a 45 school day timeline for initial evaluations. So we'll be sending out some, we will be sending out some further guidance on evaluations, but as it stands, if there's a referral for an initial evaluation, a, a school should proceed like they normally would and gather and review existing data. 
uh, meet and determine whether or not uh, you will pursue an additional assessments or if you feel like you have enough information to not pursue additional assessments, get parent consent, and then um, do your best to try to get those evaluations done within the 45 days. And if you do not, uh, OSEP and the OSDE recognizes that those would be exceptional circumstances. Um, in all things, parents should be informed of everything going on and um, they should be done through mutual agreement. Okay, thank you, Todd. Um, a couple of others, got a couple of questions about um, how paraprofessionals could be used during this time, um, particularly with um, instruction for students with disabilities that requires to be in person. Um, can paraprofessionals work with students in their homes? Do you have any um, guidance on that? I would say that that is an IEP team decision and a parent decision. I don't think it would be best to have paras traveling to homes to work with students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, services should, services will look different. Um, there's no question about that. It's going to be up to the IP teams to determine exactly how those services should look. Um, kids that need a person there with them, uh, I recognize that that's going to be problematic for districts to figure out what to do, but they're going to have to try to think of comp some kind of comparable service they could provide parents without technology. And I would first say that um, it's really important to determine which parents have technology, which teachers have technology. Um, our guidance will provide some suggestions on non-technological distance learning. Um, you know, either distributed through email or like we were talking about earlier with packets um, via the phone. Uh, we're working on also some videos and various things like that for parents about behavior specifically. Um, and I saw a question about who's providing the service if it's one on one because of a FERPA issue. Um, just, you know, Virtual learning in general, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are students that receive education virtually in a group, like a Google Classroom. So it's not necessarily the case that all distance, all virtual learning would violate FERPA. Um, that happens a lot. Uh, that happens in colleges. Um, so I'll say though that the, the question about having a non-special ed certified teacher provide some kind of instruction, the key there is to look at on the IEP, who does it state provides the direct instruction? If it says direct instruction for math from a special ed teacher, the expectation would still be that a special ed certified teacher provides that instruction. But I think you'll see more clearly through the continuous learning guidance that is going to be issued from the department and the distance learning guidance from our office that um, the, the expectations are not that every child is sitting at a desk for eight hours a day in their house while they're receiving virtual instruction. Um, and so I think as you think through those, this might be easier to uh, kind of wrap your head around how, how exactly would we provide these services in a comparable way for students with disabilities as much as we are to non-disabled, their non-disabled peers. Okay, thank you, Todd. I think that really answers a lot of those questions. So we'll um, switch to um, child nutrition now. I think Jennifer- Hey, hey Carolyn. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brad. Sorry, just before you go, I saw a friend of mine uh, send in a question on the board that says I, I didn't really answer the attendance question. Uh, so thank you, Alicia. Um, I wanna jump back into that and make sure that I do answer it. Um, I, I think the short answer is that attendance in, in this distance learning requirement is, is not going to be required um, from a, a state perspective, that is. From a state perspective, attendance has only ever been required for purposes of ADA and uh, in a certain way school accountability with chronic absenteeism. Neither of those are in play uh, at this point forward for the rest of the school year. I am aware of uh, some local district policies that uh, require a certain level of attendance for uh, various you know, achievements, if you will, 
um, those may still be in play, but from a state perspective and reporting attendance, uh, that is not going to be a requirement from this point forward. Okay, ready to move on to um, child nutrition now? Um, Jennifer, could you just um, update the group on uh, what waivers are still outstanding, if there's been any additional progress uh, since our last call on additional waiver approvals. Hello? 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Through my computer, now you can. Okay, as far as waivers, I submitted another one today requesting a second request for the waiver for the 50% uh, free and reduced requirement by site. We were told on our regional call on yesterday morning, I believe, that if we tweaked that to include a few additional things, they were starting to consider those. So that was sent uh, right before this call down to my regional office. So fingers crossed that we can get something taken care of with that. There were three nationwide waivers issued late Friday night, uh, one that waived congregate feeding, which we already had, one that waived, waived the mealtime restrictions, which we already had in place. And then we have a, um, today just recently, just less than two hours ago, received a nationwide meal pattern waiver. We are working through that right now. We have to do a lot of tracking on our end, so we're putting our, things in place to make sure that we track that and that information will go out to everybody tomorrow. There will be information you have to send back to us based on this waiver and the area consultant that normally calls on your school for child nutrition will be make, heading that up. I plan on having a meeting with them tomorrow virtually, letting them know that and then we will go out with that information to you all. So that information is coming for the, uh, the nationwide meal pattern waiver that came out this afternoon. Um, there's also one, I apologize. Um, the, the other nationwide one that came out the other day had to do with the um, at-risk program and CACFP waiving the congregate feeding and the enrichment program and we have gone out with that information already. The main one we're waiting on is the 50% requirement. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Sorry. And that's going to be so important for, for all of our communities with so many people losing jobs right now. Uh, we are through the roof qualifying. We just don't have the documentation to show that. Correct. Uh, we, we need to get to a place where we can feed all kids. And I know Jennifer is pushing really hard. Monty is helping with that. Uh, this would be something that we want to uh, stress uh, the importance with Senator Langford. I agree. Okay, Jennifer, could you address um, how or if child nutrition um, services can continue if there is a, a shelter in place order in um, a city or county? From what my understanding is, talking with the regional office and other states that have already put shelter in place in place, that is determined based on how they define what the shelter in place means. So if they say that people can continue to drive up and get a meal or they can be delivered potentially, then yes, that can be done, but it has to be defined within that shelter in place is my understanding at this time. And Jennifer and Carolyn, I would echo that. According to the governor's executive memorandum yesterday, um, provision of school meals is a, a service and function that is deemed essential and exempt from right. uh, the executive order. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Jennifer, uh, maybe last question here. Um, if uh, the school year ends on May 8th or May 15th um, or after that, whenever the district um, determines, does that mean the end of the nutrition program? No, the seamless summer option that you all have applied for takes you through the entire summer. 
it's just a continuation of the national school lunch for summer some schools have applied for the summer feeding program and that's acceptable too but if you're already on the seamless summer i would just advise you to continue on it okay um one more question here child nutrition related um, does the child have to be present in order to uh, for a family to pick up the meal believe it or not we still don't have guidance on that my advice to you because this is what's required as of right now. Yes, I have to tell you the child has to be present. We have asked, we meaning our seven states in our Southwest region with USDA have been asking for clarification on that since last Tuesday morning. Okay, let's um, shift gears a little bit now. Um, uh, Brad or superintendent um, regarding the extension of a possible emergency certification for a third year. Um, do you have any um, comment on um, what progress toward a certification looks like? So one of the requirements is that the teacher have made progress toward standard certification. Any ideas right now on what those um, requirements might be? Yeah, this is actually something, I um, appreciate that question. This is something that we uh, looked at last year in the, and was actually in the guidance that we put out last summer um, as a part of this. I think some of that may, may change actually. Um, for example, one of the requirements from last summer was the um, a attempts at completing the uh, required assessments for the certification. Um, given where we are in these circumstances, that may not even be possible. Um, and so I think that's something we're going to have to re-examine. I don't have the exact answer today, but um, I appreciate that question and adding it to the list. And Brad, could you maybe just summarize what was included in the waivers that uh, the board approved today? Once again, um, had a question about whether or not uh, personal financial literacy in specific was included. Yep, so the, the list of waivers, um, and we can send this out again, was the, the school calendar, the length of the annual term, um, the reading assessment for the driver's license permit, which was actually um, not in a waiver, but it was taken up through a rule. And so uh, to explain that as succinctly as I can, um, we have worked with the Department of Public Safety to um, they will take the emergency rule that was granted by the state board today, um, which grants a medical exemption to all students from the school testing requirements. DPS will take that and apply that exemption uh, so that the requirement of demonstrating um, successful passage of the reading test is not applicable. Um, the next one was on a school audit acknowledgement form. That school audit acknowledgement form is no longer required. The instructional day, the no longer requirement of the six hours. Uh, TLE was another big one uh, today. That is no longer a requirement. Uh, it does not seem appropriate to try to hold teachers to uh, rubrics that quite honestly did not envision uh, the circumstances and where we are right now. So. Um, those are the list. Um, I'm happy to send it out, or we can again, but um, it was a lengthy list. And it is um, included in the news release that went out. There is a link to the amended order, and I don't know if we also included the um, agenda for today, but that would have a list, a running list of those things that were discussed, at least. Um, just having to think. Yeah, and Carolyn, on, on the question about uh, PFL, financial literacy, um, I'll answer that the same way as the CPR and the PE requirements. State board does not really have the authority to waive those requirements, uh, but what the board did was um, strongly encourage all flexibilities that can be utilized to make sure that those are completed, um, the opportunities are available to demonstrate completion of those activities. So. And by the way, I'll give you feedback for, I know some of our kids took the personal financial literacy through digital uh, modules on uh, it, maybe their eighth grade year or in the summer before their freshman year. 
And I would love to just share back out that every single time we meet with our student advisory, which is made up of 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, they re repeat and underscore how they wish they had that they're closer to graduating. And it may be something worth sharing again. Okay, along those same lines, um, uh, do the assurances require local board action? No, they do not. Okay, uh, Superintendent, um, could you describe um, what you're expecting OETA to be offering? Yes, and you can look at some of the other states that are doing this as well with their PBS affiliate. They have a large catalog of children's uh, and student programming, which is grade specific and subject specific. And our curriculum and instruction folks are working right now with OETA to examine what is being taught in those and see what they would recommend for programming so that it would be another source and tool for our schools to use with children of different ages uh, where a TV and an antenna will at least get coverage with 11 towers blanketing the state. So there will be more details on that programming. OETA is uh, making plans to clear their daytime programming to be able to accommodate this. Okay, a couple more questions still about distance learning. Lots of questions about awarding grades to kids and what the expectation is there and what happens if, um, for example, you send work home with a student but they don't return it. Yeah, I think that it, it, if we were thinking about how we manage our students in regular classrooms, uh, we're going to need to pull on those same kinds of or draw on those same um, strategies to connect. It's all about that relationship and connection. Um, we, we know that this is going to be different and it is going to bring different challenges. Uh, but it, it is, I think, going to be helpful to have the distance learning framework to get an idea of expectation of time during the day or week. I think that will help with, with some of this. And then also um, just adapting from what we already know works in a physical setting to a distance learning setting. And I think there will be more crossover than than we would think in this in this area okay superintendent i think we'll do um one last question and then we can kind of wrap up um there was kind of a, a comment and a question uh, that i i wanted to read from uh, someone uh, many children teachers parents and grandparents will be facing mental health issues due to loss of jobs loss of resources for food, dealing with paying for homes and utilities. This will be a large burden to add on parents uh, during this crisis. Uh, do we have plans for providing additional resources and mental health supports uh, for schools and for um, students and parents that might be experiencing these burdens? Well, these are certainly very key and important issues to me. And I know it's on the minds of you, you those of you leading districts as evidenced by the question. Um, but yes, we do address mental health and social emotional support in our distance learning framework. So you will see that. Um, we also know that the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services is also gearing up to be able to provide support. And we have all of our team in our um, student Office of Student Support engaged and working with counselors right now to be able to uh, continue the kind of service and training that um, needs to be utilized uh, in a, a distance learning setting just as much as in a physical learning setting. Um, 
But, you know, I think it's important when we hear it framed as a reminder of all of the hardship that's happening. I mean, it, it is true. This is, this is happening all over, and, and everyone is, is feeling some kind of impact, whether they have contracted the virus, whether they know someone who has, whether um, their routine has been abruptly changed. Uh, I don't know anyone who hasn't had that happen. Um, but the loss of job and uncertainty of income, we can't understate, overstate how, how much that does impact the whole family. And we, we would also ask that, and I'll say this on this call, not necessarily something I wanted to describe on today's board meeting um, live feed, but we do have the same responsibility to report abuse or, or the um, suspicion of abuse, and especially as we know that there will be still engagement of conversation with children, any self-reporting of of a uh, abusive situation is something that we still have an obligation to take to DHS and report with, to DHS or law enforcement. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll just leave it with that. And we will, we will, we're never going to be able to do this perfect in, in six weeks. Um, we are operating right now two weeks ahead maybe three weeks ahead of something some might call a crisis. But the time to prepare and plan is before that happens. And so I think we're gonna make those plans and I know I have confidence in, in those on this phone call that you will think through so many things that are gonna be critical for success, but there will be those things that we don't anticipate. And we are going to get through them and we've, we've gotta stay flexible and extend as much grace as we can to one another and please keep the lines of communication open so that as we hear common concerns and um, common needs we are able to leverage more of a, a state answer to assist Hey, Superintendent, um, uh, I think we can wrap up and you might point people to, um, is this uh, call being recorded and where could they find it maybe afterward? Yes, um, all of the calls we have had are recorded on our YouTube channel and you are able to listen back. I believe those are also um, located on the website. I'm looking at Phil right now. Is that accurate? Yeah, on our YouTube site. On our YouTube site. So I think that's, can you tell us what that, how you find that? I, I don't know. If they go to Oklahoma State Department of Education. Oklahoma State Department, State Department of Education, State. it will take you to, you to YouTube and to the site. To our site. To our site. And then you're able to listen back uh, or uh, address other questions. Um, we know there are many that we're not answered and we're happy to uh, go through those and include more in our FAQs. So please look for um, additional information on Friday. And thanks for your work on the surveys. I appreciate all of you and thank you for all that you're doing. I'm hearing from some incredible, just incredible stories about how you are making um, plans for a uh, time of graduation ceremonies uh, and it, they're really inspiring some of the some of the things you all are considering to keep it special all right one more thing um, let me just double check something before we get off uh, just a reminder again that senator u.s. senator um, James Langford will be on our call on Friday and the time for that is one o'clock I believe we will be sending out another reminder. So we will see you then. Thanks for what you're doing. I appreciate all of you.